So I work with Bob. Um, and you've got to work with me, okay? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be praying for you. Um, the, um, now there's, there's spare copies of the Uluru State from the Heart uh, down the front. If we, um, if we need some spares, hand it out. And uh, but, uh, but let's begin there. I just want to start again by uh, providing my own involvement of um, traditional custodians of the land in which we gather, the Upper and Children peoples, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging uh, as, we, uh, as we gather and as we gather to talk about um, the uh, referendum to the voice of uh, this voice to Parliament. This is what we're going to do today, um, over the next hour, uh, because we're going to look at the Uluru Statement. Uh, we're going to be watching a couple of videos, short little videos, uh, which are publicly available as well. Uh, but we're just going to be watching short, short grabs. Uh, Dean Parkin, who is uh, the, he's the lead uh, for the Yes campaign nationally. Uh, so we're going to see him and listen to him give a TED talk from five years ago, 2018, uh, about the Uluru Statement. And he's going to share a little bit of background information, we're going to hear a little bit of that. We're going to hear other things um, around a roadmap. Uh, a roadmap gets mentioned by name in the Uluru in the statement. Uh, and that roadmap is voice, treaty, truth to the book or truth-telling treaty. I think it might be that word. Mm -hmm. Voice, truth, and treaty. Uh, and uh, we're going to hear about sovereignty, and there's going to be a little bit of uh, discussion and presentation on what, so what Indigenous sovereignty is, uh, because uh, it's different to a political concept or definition of sovereignty. So we'll hear a little bit about that. Uh, and then we're going to hear, just going down a little bit more, Makarata, seeking a Makarata commission. That's got to do with truth telling. Uh, Makarata, we'll hear it again, um, we'll hear it in the, uh, one of the videos, which is short. It's the, it, it is a word that's used by specific uh, indigenous uh, people to describe what happens after there's been a struggle or conflict and the process of coming together uh, and making amends so that two groups that were that had a struggle can move forward together. So that's so Makarata is a word that's going to come into the later. We'll have a little bit of uh, from Noel Pearson as well. So there'll be some short grabs of Noel Pearson um, explaining to, explaining what the effect of the yes vote will be. And if we have any time then there'll be some other opportunity to see some more videos from Noel Pearson um, around, the, around issues of uh, the potential for a, a, a voice to parliament being divisive or racist, because that is an objection that we hear about it. And what does, and what does he have to say about that? As, as a person who was part of the 250 uh, delegates that put together the Uluru Statement, So that's, that's the outline, uh, and then we'll probably have a time at the end for questions, conversation, probably more conversation, I'm guessing, but if there are any questions, then you will have to absolutely have those questions. Yeah. I'm sorry that today is not going to be, I would, I would have loved for this time to be more conversation based, rather than information giving, uh, but this is this is the design of it today. So the, this is I think this is probably for the best as well. If we had more time, then we could do the sort of more conversation and, and that kind of thing. So I apologise up front uh, about that. But hey, it's going to be really great um, and really informative. So uh, we're going to hear. I think now this this is going to jump to uh, Dean Park and uh, giving uh, a portion of his TED talk from 2018. For his uh, wonderful work in the country earlier today. I want to acknowledge his peoples, the Ngunnawal peoples, the traditional owners of the land on which we gather. I pay my respects 
to their elders past and present. And I bring greetings from my Kwanamuka peoples from Minjuraba or North River Island, as you may know, just off the coast of Brisbane. It may look like I'm standing here on this stage by myself, but I am not. While you can't see the people standing behind me, I can feel their spirit. My Kwanamuka ancestors and generations of other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been crafting this story for more than 200 years. My story is not my own, nor is it new. It is an old story, and one whose time to come. This story is a universal statement from the heart. This statement speaks to me because I was closely involved in its creation. My signature, etched into its canvas as I knelt in the red soil of Mutajulu in the shadows of Uluru on the 26th of May, 2017. I remember that moment for many reasons. Seeing the wonder of the yellow-clad Gumach and the blues and the greens of the Torres Strait dances, kicking up clouds of red on Arnold Land. I remember the looks on people's faces, the quiet smiles, the camaraderie of people who only hours earlier had brought this statement to life. But most of all, I remember how exhausted I felt. In this moment of such importance to my peoples and my nation, I felt a tiredness in my bones and in my soul. I was utterly spent. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, there's something wrong. I should be feeling enthused and energised about what we've just done. And then I reflected on everything that had happened to get to this point. I'd worked with the Referendum Council as it held 13 regional dialogues with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across the country. Led by Arnie Pat Anderson, Professor Megan Davis and Noel Pearson, it was the most comprehensive process ever to engage Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the hard business of constitutional and structural reform. My job was to capture the stories of more than 1,200 people as they gave their hearts and their minds to the dialogues. Standing in front of the room at each of the dialogues, I could hear and feel the passion, the grief, the hope, the challenges and the ideas of people who had spent decades striving for change. I remember helping shape the agenda and co-facilitating the Uluru Convention. Sitting in my room the night before is all about to start thinking of all the work that we'd done up to that point was finally coming to a head. Knowing that more than 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were gathering nearby, preparing to do the hard work of reaching a consensus in the next three days, and I had absolutely no idea what that consensus would be. On the morning of the final day of the convention, Megan read the statement for the very first time. At that point, my emotions were just boiling inside of me. I felt an enormous pride in my people for the work that they'd already done. I felt nervous for the reception. I didn't know what the reception of the statement might be. And I was just hanging on to every single word, feeling the tension just ripple through the room. So Megan finishes that reading, and the response was more than 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people getting to their feet in a spontaneous standing ovation. I get goosebumps now just thinking about it. It was that real. It was an emphatic endorsement of this statement. This is truly a historic consensus and a compelling mandate for reform. So all of that was weighing on me in that moment of exhaustion. And then I look up and I see Annie Pat. And I see this look on her face. This just says it all. It shows a lifetime of dedication, of sacrifice, of service to her nation. It shows the triumph of that moment tinged with the sadness of those that did not live to see it. And it shows the determination to complete the job of weaving the ancient and modern identities of Australia 
into a more complete whole. In seeing that look on her face, it reminded me that I've been in the scene for about five min minutes compared to warriors like herself. And in a really strange way, it just allowed me to let that tiredness and exhaustion just slip from my shoulders.
With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Sovereignty, with that word mentioned there, uh, which comes up again in the uh, Uluru statement. Uh, we'll, get to, we'll get to that just shortly. Something that just pointed out to me then, in the context of our worship that we just had, and the reading of uh, the creation of the first human from the dust, uh, did you hear? Did you hear the connection that in his own language, in Dean's own language, about connection to connection to land and to soil, and that deep connection? Make that what you like, but uh, interesting. One of the things that comes out in the statement is this roadmap to peace, and uh, some of the things that I mentioned here. That this statement and what the group did is perceived to be a gift to the nation. Uh, that it's, a, as it says here, an exercise in nation building. That's the intention behind the statement and the intention behind the reform as well. It's seen as a conversation between the two groups, Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples, about how we can all belong together. And again, this is coming from Indigenous peoples. The gift that is given includes roadmap. Roadmap to peace, roadmap to reconciliation. <coughs> these three things, voice, treaty, and truth. So what is the truth? The truth telling? It's about our nation acknowledging its past actions toward Indigenous Australians and providing a forum for that to, to occur in a way in which it's received by our nation and her. It includes a voice where Indigenous Australians have a say in matters that affect them. And it includes it doesn't say the word treaty in the Uluru Statement, but it does talk about, um, what is the word that's given there? It's a, it escapes me at the moment, but there's a different phrase that's used. I think it's agreement making. I believe it's agreement making, yes. Down the bottom, we seek a Makarata Commission to supervise the process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. So, treaty is the popular word, truth, uh, agreement making is how it appears. It's form in the Philippi Statement about walking together into a future. A unanimous theme across the dialogues, across Australia from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is that First, sovereignty makes, First Nations sovereignty has never been ceded. At the Ross River Dialogue, about 100 kilometres east of Alice Springs, with three interpreters in the room to take into account the different language groups, people talked about their Jukapa, their unshakable connection to their past, present and future. It is their law and it's their way of life. They did not talk about sovereignty as some sort of abstract political concept. In fact, the word itself was barely mentioned. Not because it is unimportant, but because it is so fundamental to who they are, it is impossible to imagine living a life without it. It has never been and will never be seen. Sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty, as we would normally think about it, is in its political sense, which has to do with uh, dominant power and who has authority here. Would that be a fair thing to, to say when we think about sovereignty? Um, but as what indigenous sovereignty looks like is quite a bit different. It doesn't have to do with a political concept, but rather a spiritual concept. 
And it's, as I think, as I think, uh, they're articulating a relationship, a relationship that Indigenous people have to land. And that's what they're giving voice to there. And the relationship is of a spiritual nature, which is then tied back to identity um, and and making and ensuring that they they establish who they are as that relates back to their family and their ancestry, which includes notions of story and uh, cultural identity as that relates to behaviour and custom and those kinds of things. So some notes here, um, essentially saying that. The second state of the Uluru State calls for ancient sovereignty to be recognised through structural reform, including constitutional change. Enshrining a First Nations voice is recognition of First Nations sovereignty. It is not instead of crown sovereignty, it is as well as. Because those two concepts are not in competition with each other. The same word is used, but a different meaning is given to one, because it relates to something different. So. I suppose it's probably worth reminding ourselves, um, stating anyway, stating to be clear, because I'm sure you're already well aware why we're doing this, or, or even why has this been requested. Uh, and it's for some of these reasons that are, that, are here, that the policies and practices uh, have systematically disadvantaged Indigenous people from from invasion, from colonial power taking control and asserting this belongs to us now, this belongs to the empire, this land, everything in it belongs to empire. Uh, and that has continued on through the formation of federation in 1901 and the constitution that was written informed and produced through what well, if we have a chance to hear about uh, through the omission the omission of indigenous peoples in the constitution which is why we're talking which is why we're hearing about recognition of indigenous peoples in the constitution because they do not appear and are deliberately excluded uh, the second point, the transmission of trauma, poverty, poor nutrition, inadequate education and healthcare has resulted in disadvantage from generation to generation. And in recent uh, iterations of government, we've heard about the Closing the Gap report and the work of Closing the Gap. And the reason why that's been a focus, uh, others, uh, others of you can, can contribute to this as well, probably better than me. But the reason why we're talking about this is because there is an acknowledgement that Indigenous Australians are facing disadvantage in ways that non-Indigenous peoples collectively, generally, don't. Just some of the ways. Um, through, sorry, you know, whether it's the, the rate of suicide amongst people, particularly uh, young Indigenous people, Youth incarceration, homelessness, unemployment, and life expectancy. Just some of the ways that uh, Indigenous lives track and trend, just in a few of these different ways. And if, and if we're across the, the intention of closing the gap, and the closing the gap report, and the work that's there, the intention of it is to address these issues. The trouble with them and the problem with them has been that who are the people making the decisions about that work? And who are the people who are having a say about how that work should or shouldn't go forward? And unfortunately it kind of depends on the people of the day 
will, will determine the answer to those kinds of questions. Uh, but from what we'll hear uh, through the course of the next half hour or so is that the voice of Parliament will ensure that at least there is a say going forward from Indigenous peoples about these very things, which is not always the case. It is sometimes the case, it is, it is sometimes the case in a localised way, because there are various uh, bodies that do exist uh, where there is uh, Indigenous empowerment uh, and where Indigenous people do have a say, but it's, it's not at a national level. It's not with our national government. And it's also, uh, yeah, obviously. Mm -hmm. Moving on to Makarata. Sort of flying through these things here, so I hope, I hope you're doing okay. Mm -hmm. Now on the Yongu concept of Makarata, capturing that idea of two parties coming together after a struggle, healing those divisions of the past. It's acknowledging that something has been done wrong and it seeks to make things right. So I think about a person like, I think about it within the Christian faith as a process of reconciliation, like Christian reconciliation, or theological forgiveness, uh, making amends. Uh, that's when, uh, when Jesus says uh, in Matthew 5, I think it is, uh, if you know that there is something that uh, your brother or your, you know, has against you and you're there at the altar, don't offer your gift Leave it there. Go and be uh, restored to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Which I, which I heard, uh, was actually the reverse of what, of what the teaching at the time. Uh, just recently, the teaching at the time was: if you, if you, you know that you're separated from your brother, it's better to offer your gift first, and then go sort that out. Whereas Jesus says, no, that can wait. That's more important. So I hear echoes of that kind of intent in this concept. Which is all about this. Um, having genuine reconciliation. Not just a statement about it, but actual relation coming together. Uh, at a political level, and hopefully at a social level. So the kind of trip was over. Supervising a process of truth telling so that the full extent of the past injustices experienced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is understood. Providing support, processes, and momentum so parties reach agreements at a regional and national level. So we're, so we're changing the story through a process like this, and the opportunity to change our story as a nation kinds of people that we that we are from now into the future. We can't change what's in the past, but what we can do is acknowledge it and provide an opportunity for that truth to be told. So go back to the roadmap. Yeah, it's seen as a gift for the nation. Uh, it's a conversation that we're invited into offers a roadmap uh, for how that can happen. And then finally, it asks for this uh, call for all Australians to walk together for a tribe voice to parliament so that agreement making and truth telling and finally uh, occur on equal terms. On equal terms. Uh, we're going to hear now from uh, Noel Pearson. And this is, uh, this is from a conversation, a three way conversation, that Sharon Hollis, who's uh, Reverend Sharon Hollis, who's our United Church President at the moment still, uh, facilitated a couple of weeks ago. It was in our notices, uh, and there's a recording of that conversation that's available uh, online, and uh, happy to point the way to where that is, and he provide the link in our notices uh, in our next publication. Uh, but we're going to hear from Noel uh, on this question of, uh, of the, uh, the effect of the referendum. Oh, you're right, you? Um, as you know, there's a range of criticisms about the voice. One is about the lack of detail, while others wonder what the influence of the Karma Lantern report will be on shaping the implementation 
um, of the verse. What do you say to people who, who either think there's too much detail or not enough detail about the voice? Well, when you read the provision that we're going to vote on, it clearly states that this poem is wrong in legislative detail. You want me to put it up now? Yeah, that is always, that would be useful. Yeah. It is always the case that this poem is wrong. So the, you, you look at the third paragraph. Yes. Parliament shall have power to make laws um, in respect of matters relating to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, including its composition, functions, powers, and procedures. Now that's the detail that you to understand, the detail of the constitutional provision. Um, it's like the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Commission. It's under a constitutional Constitutional power as well. I don't know, six, seven words in, in section 51 of the Constitution. And the Parliament legislated the first ABC in 1932. It then substantially amended it in 1942 during the war. And then in 1983, it scrapped it all together and created a new act the Aboriginal Board, uh, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation Act. So this is the thing, the detail can change according to the whim of power. It's Parliament's job, it's our system of democracy. We vote the Parliament in to make laws. And so the, it's the Parliament's job to supply the detail. Mm -hmm. Detail today may differ from the detail in 15 years' time, or 35 years' time, and so on. And I expect the Parliament will do the same thing with the voice. We'll have one version, maybe a very strongly, hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, influenced by the Calvin Langton work, because that's the latest work that Indigenous people have been involved in. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you don't know whether the Parliament will adopt all of the ideas in the Calvin Langton report. We're not the parliamentarians. It's Peter Dutton who's the parliamentarian, and, and Albanese, and Bat, and Hanson. Um, they're all the people who have decided the detail. And, and as I say, in five years' time or ten years' time, um, they might want to change the detail in small ways, or they might want to get rid of the detail and put new detail in. What they can't we do this though, is never have a voice. That's the one thing the Australian people will say when they vote yes to this referendum. Mm -hmm. It falls one way. It is because of that clause, that green, the green light is there. That's the guarantee. There shall be a voice. That means, yes, you can get rid of the existing body, but you always have to replace it. With a different one. Um, so that's that's how our parliamentary system works, and you know, this is how the detail will be will, will be generated. It will be generated by our parliament. And so then, what do you think some of the key issues that the voice will engage with might be in the first couple of years? I guess. Oh, you know, we've got such urgent issues. There's 19 of them on the closing the gap again. Yes. So I don't know. That is a crucial. That will be, that'll be first cast in the rain. Now we can't do everything all at once. The, the, the voice will have to be smart. The voice will have to prioritize. The voice will have to come up with good ideas. Because if some of these things are not working mm -hmm. um, and are not closing the gap, What's the, you know, what are the alternative ideas that people will have about tackling these problems? Yeah. Just to uh, just to put those words up again uh, for us about this 
This is what the referendum is going to come down to, these words here. This is what we're saying, being asked to say yes or no to this. Um, and, whether, and whether we agree with these words or not, with, in, as, a, as an addition to the Constitution. Advisory bodies in the past, um, and they've been set up by either 
through policy or just through legislation, but without the constitutional backing, they get chucked out as soon as um, the politics change, as soon as problems arise, right? So, is that if we all vote yes, that will be a national constitutional commitment to always ensuring that Indigenous communities will have a say in their affairs. Um, and that is powerful. You know, if all Australians vote yes to that, that has the potential to change the political culture in a serious way in Australia. So that it's an expectation, There's, there'll be an expectation of partnership, you know, of working together, of dialogue, of mutual respect. And that, that could be a game changer. Um, so the, the permanence um, and, the, and the, the seriousness of that national commitment is, is um, something I think to get really excited about. But at the same time, it's pragmatic because while the principle, will, if we vote yes, then the Indigenous people will be recognised and the principle that Indigenous communities must always have a voice in their affairs, that principle will be locked into the constitution. But Parliament will retain full flexibility and full control to set up the voice the way it sees fit, to determine all the details, and importantly, to change those details over time. Mm. But that's a really important distinction, that what we're voting on in the referendum is the principle. Do Indigenous people deserve to be recognised in the Constitution through having a guaranteed voice in their affairs? If we say yes to that, then it's Parliament's job to nut out all the details and to evolve and improve the institution over time as needed. There's one, there's one last uh, little, little grab that we want to show. Uh, and this is uh, going back to uh, Noel, returning to Noel. And the question being put to Noel was about uh, that objection uh, to the voice that it would create uh, division uh, or is racist uh, in, its, um, in its principle. So we're, here, we're going to hear Noel Pearson's response to that question. There's been some concern expressed that a voice enshrined in the Constitution would divide Australia. Now, you said that in fact the very opposite can be true, that this could be um, a moment that will complete and unify Australia. Can you tell us what you mean by that? You're on mute. Well, we weren't recognised when the country was colonised. And we weren't recognised when Australia came together for the Federation in 1901. And we remain unrecognised in our own country. How could that be right? Mm. And how could, how could the exclusion of our people from the constitution of our own country be a good thing? And uh, there's a division there. Yes. And we're trying to kill them. This recognition. This was in fact an agenda started in this modern period by John Howard. It was John Howard in 2007 that kicked off the recognition campaign. Mm. He told the Australian people at the beginning of the 2007 election that he felt there was time, this was the time for a new settlement, um, that Australians were ready for this. And, um, that we, and he committed to taking a question to a referendum within 18 months if he was reelected. So, fact of the matter is that this has been an agenda started by political conservatives 15 years ago. It is the right idea, they had the right idea back then. It is still the right idea today. And the idea is a constitutional way. Not just the legislation is what you is the coat you hang on the hook in the constitution. What we're doing at this referendum is putting a hook, constitutional hook in the constitution that um, then allows the power to create the voice. Um, I think that it's going to be unified for the country. We're going to complete the Constitution through recognition. And how, how can inclusion be uh, 
divisive. I, I just strongly believe that when we, we, we put the last piece of the jigsaw together with recognition, we will have a more united country. We will have a country that is that is um, particularly between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people. That is that is not fearful and uncertain. At the moment, Australians are uncertain. How the hell do we deal with the Indigenous people? How do we deal with the fact that we didn't, we didn't make provision for their recognition in the colonial times? Mm -hmm. Well, the fact of the matter is it's never too late for reconciliation. Never too late. Yes, we're 235 years into our, into our story here in, in modern Australia, since the Europeans came. Yes, yes, it is two centuries later, but it is never too late for reconciliation. And the, the key to reconciliation is justice. Mm -hmm. If we, you know, if we put the, the wrong things right, the, the things that we can make good, let's make them good. And when we do that, we find that that, that reconciliation is never impossible. Mm -hmm. and there's never a bad time, never a, 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 a too late in the day time for, for reconciliation. And we're going to prove this to the world. We're going to prove to the world an important principle, which is that it is never too late to do it. Mm -hmm. Yet you could say, oh, why did we do it in 1788? Well, we didn't. Why did we do it in 1901? Well, we didn't. Why did we do a proper job in 1967? Well, we didn't. But I'm telling you that 2023 will be the day when we show the world that, oh, even late in the day, we can still reconcile. Mm -hmm. Because we do the justice that's needed for reconciliation. Thank you. I think that, that says beginning a, a new uh, episode in our healing is a really important sense of, of what, what's been offered here in terms of unifying. Shireen, you are, you're a constitutional lawyer, so you, you get the document well. Um, and I do know some people are concerned that, um, that, that the, the question of the referendum is a race-based kind of um, addition to the constitution. What do you say to people who argue that? Yeah, it's related to the previous question, isn't it? Because people say, oh, this will divide us by race, or this is re-racialising the Constitution, or putting race back into the Constitution. It's um, completely factually incorrect, right? So race has been in the Constitution, unfortunately, since 1901. Mm. Well, Australians have been divided by race under the Constitution since 1901, and no one has suffered more under that than Indigenous people who were excluded and discriminated against because they were considered an inferior race. Mm. And race-based discriminatory provisions are still in there. You know, and the exclusion that I talk about is not just some theoretical on paper exclusion. That flowed into real laws and policies that Indigenous people suffered up. So I'm talking about um, laws denying Indigenous people the vote in some jurisdictions right up until the 60s, and actually formal voting equality across the board wasn't achieved until something like 1983. Uh, I'm talking about policies that denied them the payment of equal wages, sometimes non-existent wages were paid. You can have some rations instead. Um, I'm talking about policies that removed children from families, sometimes banned their languages from being spoken. You know, so the exclusion, the race-based discrimination that Indigenous people suffered is not some theoretical thing. So I think it's pretty rich of some opponents now to claim that this is dividing us by race. This is doing the opposite. This is correcting the race-based exclusion of the past by finally including the one group that was previously excluded and finally guaranteeing that they will at least have a voice when Parliament makes laws and policies about them. So just to make a point, only one group was excluded in 1901, 
right, under the forms of Indigenous people. And only one group was dispossessed in 1788, Indigenous people. So Indigenous people do occupy a special place in our history and under our constitution. And today, there is only one group for whom the Commonwealth Parliament makes special laws and policies specifically about them under a special constitutional power, the race power, that it only ever uses to make laws about Indigenous people. Mm. Laws like the Native Title Act, laws like closing the gap policies, Indigenous heritage protection. All this is saying is that when Parliament and Government makes those laws and policies about Indigenous Australians, they should have the ability to give advice so that the policies can be fairer, more effective, less wasteful, and hopefully we can, we can start to close the gap. So this is not in any way about dividing. Division was in the past. Mm. This is about including those previously excluded. It's about uniting, as Noel said. That was a very powerful argument. Uh, all right. I'm just going to flick forward. There's a, there's a video here, but I want to skip over it. And so I might need your help uh, there, Bruce, if this clicker doesn't work for me. And, and I think the voice is going to have to um, uh, really be hard do a lot of work yeah. have a look around the country. Yeah. Thank you. Great. That brings us to a close on the formal kind of presentation part. So good news, we've got a bit of time, hopefully up our sleeves, and you do, for a little bit of conversation and questions. A lot to take in. Again, it's a lot to take in. But, uh, so I'm just going to open up now, and we can have some conversation if you like, raise questions, make comments, uh, as you like. So a bit of an open scenario. How are you feeling? <laughs> okay. I want the boys to succeed. You want the boys to succeed, yeah. Yeah. I'm very concerned that that's not. Yeah. Yeah. As a as a I'll just name for mis for myself, for you all, I want the boys to succeed. Um I'm a bit uh yeah. I'm not my hope is waning a little bit. Heather. Sorry. I've had two um, inputs from two sources recently that have been very helpful. Um, when considering, considering trying to think about how people are, um, don't want the voice to succeed feel, because it's the important thing, I think, is always to try and understand where all the people are coming from. Um, but the two things were, um, Rod Fisher put on his Facebook page, um, quote about the way people will vote will be an expression of their hope or an expression of their fear. And I thought that was a, a really interesting thing. And the other came from the, the gathering up at Willis Hill State School. And the one question that was useful to me and that I will ask now for everyone, please, is um, we hear all the, all the yes votes and all the yes groups sort of think something's well, we're going to be serious. What do you say to people who say, but look what they're doing, they're going to close the roof for climbing, they're going to close, close them, or they're going to close glass houses very class house matters. They close this, they close that there. They're, um, the young people in town still in place and running into the running amok. There's for all of these issues um, that create a fear in the community about the sense of giving indigenous people what they see as power. How do very simply, I mean I can go through all the arguments, but they don't seem to, that, that's to me is not the issue, it's, it's the issue of how to come up with something succinct that can, well, I have one line on it on my Facebook that says, this is why I don't agree with your perceptions of things. Mm. Mm. 
it's tough, isn't it? Because um, those two different issues, those two examples, are very different examples. One is, you know, like uh, the freedom to move and um, uh, move about a, a particular geographical location. You know, so look at Uluru, we can't climb, you know, can't climb Uluru anymore. You know, that's not fair. You know, there's that issue. Um, and then how, how might that sort of what else, what else are they going to take away? You know, there's that. But then there's like the other issue you say about you know, in either regional or remote areas about crime or behaviour that leads to incarceration, that leads to... Um, why, why, would we, why would we give power to that group of people? They clearly can't manage things by themselves as is. But we're not giving power to those people, are we? We're giving them the opportunity to advise Parliament, and it's Parliament who gives the power. Yeah. It's the local state authorities or territory authorities who say you can't climb your little roof. The, the Indigenous people, sure, have, have, have requested this, but they don't have the power to stop it. Yeah, good. And that's what the voice is all about. It's, a, it's, it's advising Parliament yeah. on issues relate to the Indigenous people and I think that is, that is a very good uh, example of what they've done. Yeah. And yes, okay, they've listened to it perhaps already, but voice it puts it in the constitution. So it's the advisory. It's yeah. the advisory the advisory nature of it. Yeah. I think with the with crime issue in council, for example, and elsewhere, it's a critical area where the voice of advice would hopefully be much more effective and more useful for governments to really work with in terms of cultural change and legislation and, and probably more importantly putting money into resources that can assist you in a way that, that checks and stops the crime being so prolific. Yes, yes. Yeah. <coughs> I suppose my, my thought is um, when it comes to like closing the gap kind of issues is how's it working for us so far? Um, the way the way the governments have gone about so far hasn't worked. It's not working. No matter how much we try, how much money we throw, or is throwing, so we are not involved, but you know, like no matter what happens and how it's gone about now, what is it achieving? Surely something different must be tried. And here is a legitimate alternative that, that seeks to uh, engage in relationship. You know, that's clearly established that we can end business. And that's what the enshrined in the Constitution part means. You can't dismiss it. You do your best to, the Parliament of the day can do their best to ignore it. And not and not follow the advice. So it's good still up to the parliament. But you can't dismiss it. And presumably ideas will flow from the indigenous community as to how to address this situation. Yes. And it's up to the parliament to listen to <coughs> yeah. Now it's not so much a matter of making things illegal, it's a matter of working out how the indigenous people think the, the changes in attitude to these people who in France will uh, effectively work. Yes. And who should be involved, I suppose, is part of that as well. I mean, who's part of who's involved in sometimes I find I, I rela let me say this. If that's okay. Uh, I I relate this in a small way, in a parallel way. To the, to the ways in which church congregations have gone about its own mission, mission work, okay, um, in the community. Because often in the past it's been done as church does it to the community um, and treats community uh, as an object. And so Christian service can be done out of that with all the best intentions as well. But at the end of the day, 
when it's done like that, it's it, it yeah, it's uh, it treats it treats the person and the the community, the neighbourhood, the world as an object to which I do this action, I perform this action, and then it's an expectation that the world will respond to that action in a way that is that that is deemed appropriate, whether that be conversion or gratitude or but all those dynamics that I that I see in church history um, I see here as well and, I, and I, there's a connection here and the connection is probably colonialism and colonial thinking uh, which is all about hey we're the empire we're the ones in power we have and we have all the good ideas and we have the best ways uh, and whoever you are if you're not doing things our way, then you need to change. Jennifer? Um, when you get to know the Aborigines, they've got a lot to teach us about how to handle the land and um, understanding things. Mm -hmm. And in that place, yes, like, they should be advising. You know, another thing I've picked up over the years is the way they handle
this conversation. Yeah. Something popped through my head before, but it's gone out again. Um, yeah, I guess it's about, this is about how do we change things hearing from an indigenous point of view, whereas we've always tried to solve the problem, we naturally come from the colonizers point of view. So we come and we want to solve it from, well, we know how to do it, but we now need to actually hear what are the ways that you need to solve it, that our answer is not always right. And so we need to open up that door. How do we hear the indigenous view? How do we hear the indigenous voices? Um, so that we can look at different solutions. One of the things you discover when you work with children is others give you ways of thinking that you've never thought before. Um, there was something in RI this week, someone said something, but the one that always sticks with me is one kid when we were talking about creation said, you know, when they find, you know, scientists find new species of things, do you think that's God still creating? And I thought, I've never thought about that. And if I was God, I would be going, yeah, now let's then explain that one. Um, <laughs> that we need the different voice to help us to look differently. And so we need the voice to Parliament so that we can think differently in ways we just never will. So, yeah. Mm, that's good. I might finish off by, um, by reading out the statement uh, in full. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you'd like to stay around for this, you're welcome to. But I'd just like to read out the statement. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial, and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion. The ancestral tie between the land, or Mother Nature, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise? That peoples possess the land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not, we are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted in 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future.
thanks for your attention and for, and for coming here as well. And uh, may God continue to reconcile us in this wonderful nation that so that we can have a better future together. And may that blessing of God continue to shine a light in our hearts. And may that love of God continue to guide us and call us into relationship, reconcile relationship with one another and in particular between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. For the sake of the Lord.